Last Sunday, as uh, we explored uh, the story of the, uh, the woman caught in adultery in John 8, uh, we used uh, the metaphor of a hurricane to explore that story and talk about what was going on in that story and uh, how Jesus was present in that story and how we are called as the people of Jesus to be present in our world. So today I have another metaphor to guide us. Um, it's a little bit different. Uh, It's a medieval manuscript, because that's how my history-loving brain works. And I know you may not, uh, your brain may not work the same way. So uh, so to help you out, in the pew back in front of you, you should see a card that looks like this. And if you want to pull it out, we're going to start there, because I think this is a metaphor to help us both understand the story of the four friends in Mark chapter 2 how Mark tells the story, and also how then we are called to enter into the story. Now, the, um, the picture on the front, this is a, a Bible from 13th century France. And if you look at this Bible, I imagine one of the first questions that pops into your mind is, why are the margins so wide? I mean, this is, a, this is a Bible done before the printing press. Every page of this Bible was handwritten. So why would you write the text kind of small in the middle when you've got a bigger piece of, of paper to work with? And uh, the answer is because, uh, as you can imagine, life was very different in 13th century France. Um, this Bible would have been a treasure. I mean, think about how long it would have taken someone to do this, not just to write it out by hand, but to write it out this beautifully, this skillfully. This would have been an investment. Uh, The church or the person who owned this Bible would have, I mean, this would have been like purchasing a car. Books weren't just readily available the way that we think of books being readily available. And, you know, when Uh, You wanted a piece of paper. It wasn't as simple as going online and putting in your staples order and going back to playing Candy Crush or Solitaire or all those things that we we do when we want paper, right? This was an investment. They wanted this to last. And so the reason that they would write the text in the middle with these wide margins is to protect it. Because in uh, in the 13th century... um, books got damaged. I mean, we, we damage books too, but, and they're damaged all the ways that we damage books, but uh, there were some particular perils they wanted to protect the text from. In a world uh, that was lit by candles and oil lamps, books often caught on fire. But where would they burn from? They would burn from the edges. So if you leave a wide margin... You're protecting the text that you have worked so hard or someone has worked so hard to put there. Also in the 13th century, uh, a bookworm was not a voracious reader. A bookworm was an actual voracious worm that liked to eat things like vellum and parchment. But where would they eat from? They would start from the outside and nibble their way in. So putting the text in the center was a way to protect it, to help it to last. There was no guarantee, but if you did that, chances are you could use this Bible generations after you could use this Bible if it was well cared for. Now, it doesn't mean that they always left the margins blank. They had all this valuable paper. They made use of it. So if you turn the, the, the card over, you'll see another page. It's also a page from... A Bible, and as you'll see, someone has written in the margins. And uh, this is uh, historians love these kind of manuscripts. This is where uh, scholars wrote commentary. Instead of having a separate book or something you had to get, they would write them right there. Sometimes they would write above the lines or even like between words if they had a question or they wanted to make a point or perhaps suggest a correction. 
Uh, they would uh, write them in there. Um, so diligent people would take this, and they would write notes that to, to help themselves and to help future readers better understand what they were reading. Um, and this particular person who did this, or might have been a few people, uh, was very careful to put boxes and lines separating what's the, what's the commentary from the text. And uh, I know scholars wish that more people had been that <laughs> intentional about it, uh, because sometimes it's hard to tell. But the most important thing, the most valuable thing is in the center, and then there's additional information provided around the outside. Uh, the technical term for this is a gloss. All right, so there's this gloss to help you understand what you're reading, but the thing that in the middle is the most important thing. And then, of course, some people did what many of us do. They also doodled in the margins. <laughs> so you can see there's a, there's a decoration there of some kind, um, and uh, you can find all kinds of, of, of... It's very interesting to look at, at manuscript doodles, but they were there. Uh, some bored monks up off in a monastery somewhere uh, passing the time without Netflix drawing in the margins of these, <laughs> these manuscripts. All right, so, so that's what our metaphor is, and I, I want to, to explore this now by turning to Mark 2, uh, because it's a very... Mark tells the story in a very fascinating way. All right, we call it the story of the four, these four friends who have a paralytic friend, a person who can't walk, who's lame, and Jesus has made a name for himself by healing, and these four friends hear that Jesus is back home in Capernaum, and they want to take their friend who needs healing to Jesus. But when they get there, they find that the crowd is so thick, they can't even get through the door. There are so many people. But they do not let this deter them. They say, if we can't get through the door, the windows of houses in Jesus' day were too small, we're going to find a way to get our friend in to see Jesus. So they take him up on the roof, and they dig a hole, Mark says. This is probably some kind of earthen roof that Mark is envisioning. They literally dig through the roof. They punch a hole and then lower their friend down to Jesus. Now, they've brought him here because he's a healer. Jesus is a healer. They want Jesus to heal him. But what does Jesus say? This, this, this person is lowered through the roof down in front of him as he's teaching and he's, as he's doing his thing. And he's impressed. He's impressed by the determination and the faithfulness of these four friends who did not let the situation, the circumstances deter them from getting their friend to see him. But he doesn't say, rise and walk. He says, your sins are forgiven. It's a wonderful thing to say, but not what they were expecting. And then we get this internal dialogue from the scribes who were there. That when Jesus says this, they get their dander up. It's blasphemy! Who else can forgive sin but God? And Jesus, Mark says, doesn't hear them. They don't say anything out loud, but He senses what's going on inside them, and He responds back to them. Which is easier, to say to this man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk. But so you will know that I, the Son of Man, have the power to forgive sins. Then he says, rise and walk, and the paralytic stands up. And then Jesus says, take your mat and go. Think about how this unfolded. If we were here, like we are today, if I were preaching, if wood and other materials started falling from the ceiling into the midst of the sanctuary, and suddenly some guy on a stretcher is lowered down on ropes into the middle of us, I think we'd have some things to say. I know the facilities team would have some things to say. But 
Nobody says anything. Jesus doesn't say anything about all this commotion, all of this dirt and debris that falls into the middle of this house. Nobody says anything about it. In fact, nobody says anything in this story except Jesus. We call it the story of the four friends and the paralytic, or Jesus heals the paralytic. There are various titles that you will find in, in, in Bibles of various stripes. But it's not really a story about the four friends or the paralytic. It's a story about Jesus and who Jesus is. Jesus is at the center. Everything else that happens, the hole through the roof, the four friends bringing the paralytic, the response of the Pharisees, Jesus' response to the Pharisees, all of it is a gloss. All of it is a gloss to help us better see and understand who Jesus is. That He is the Son of Man. He is the one coming into the world. He is the Messiah. He is God incarnate who does indeed have the power to forgive sins. Yes, He's a healer. He's already healed a leper. He's cast out demons by this point in Mark. But that is not just who Jesus is. Jesus is so much more than that. And this story, Mark tells this story to help us more fully understand who Jesus is. Jesus is at the center. Everything else that happens in this story is a gloss to help us understand who Jesus is. So that's how this metaphor helps us understand the story in Mark 2. It is also a metaphor to help us understand how we as the church, how we as the people of Jesus are called to enter into this story. Because our lives should really be like, like this. If we profess that Jesus is the Messiah, if we profess that Jesus is the one who has the power to forgive sins, if we profess that Jesus is who the New Testament, who Mark and Matthew and Luke and John say Jesus is, then Jesus is the one who should be at the center of our lives, our faith, our everything. Jesus is is the the one who really matters. The gospel is what really matters. That is the thing that should be at the center of everything we do. Everything else we do is part of the gloss around that. That should help other people see and understand who Jesus is, what this gospel that we profess and proclaim is all about. That Jesus is the one who offers forgiveness and healing, the life that truly is life. We are called to be a gloss, a commentary around this story that has been given to us, that has been handed down to us. We're called to bear witness to our experience of this Jesus as a healer, as a teacher, as the risen Lord. And so our task, when we boil it down, our calling as we boil it down, our mission is to be this gloss, to help other people see who Jesus is. That's why we are called. That's what it means to bear witness. And here's the thing that we need to always remember. We are a gloss whether we seek intentionally to be one or not. If we profess Jesus, other people are looking at us and they are reading and understanding who Jesus is based on what they see in us. St. Francis is reputed to have said, preach the gospel always, if necessary, use words. The truth is, we are always preaching the gospel. The question is, 
isn't so much, are we a gloss as the church? The question is, what kind of gloss are we? Are we intentional? Are we forthright in helping people understand who Jesus truly is? Or is our witness more like a doodle in the corner? I think that's what all of us have to think about as we move forward. The world is watching. When the people look at you, when the people out in their community look at Kingsway, what do they see? Do they see a commentary about Jesus' life and love and grace? Do they see a people like the four friends who aren't afraid to make a scene, to make a mess, who are determined to bear witness to Christ Jesus, who is at the center of our story, who are determined to speak up for those who are voiceless and powerless and helpless? Are we determined to help other people come to Jesus and to experience Jesus for themselves? Or are we more like the scribes, content and comfortable simply passing judgment on other people in the musings of our hearts? Or are we some strange doodle up in the corner that no one seems to know, what's that about? (laughs) Trying to figure out what's, what's going on there. This begs another question, too. Why do we sometimes end up being doodles in the corner? There are a variety of reasons. We all have bad days. We're not perfect. We're never going to be. That's part of what our proclamation of grace is all about. And thankfully, it's not all up to us. So, Sometimes we end up being a doodle just because we can't be bothered. <laughs> and if, if that's where you are, then we can pray for you, but that's about all we can do. But others of us end up being doodles because we don't believe that we have anything constructive or insightful to say. What can my story add to the gospel story? I haven't been to seminary. I don't have a degree. I don't have a Damascus Road experience where Jesus knocked me flat on the ground and shook me up and and turned me around. Nothing that would make for good television. (laughs) I don't see anything in my life that's worth adding that other people couldn't say better or that other people haven't already said. And so that's why we need to hear and pay close attention to how this story ends. To hear Jesus say to us, just like he said to the paralytic, stand up, take your mat, and go. Jesus doesn't say, stand up, leave your mat behind and go. Stand up, take your mat, and take it with you as you go. Because for the paralytic, this mat is part of his story. This mat represents something for him. It represents how Jesus has healed him, has impacted him, how Jesus is the one who forgives sins, how Jesus is the one who Mark testifies that he is. The paralytic's mat has a story to tell, and Jesus instructs him to take the mat with him as he goes. Whenever I read this story, I think about the story of Moses in Exodus. 
how Moses became, came to be the prophet, the great figure that we know him as. You may be familiar with the story of the burning bush, how Moses was out tending his father-in-law's flocks one day, and he sees this bush that is on fire, yet the fire is not con- consuming the bush, and he's curious, and he goes over, and God speaks to him out of the fire. And he says, Moses, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. I have heard the suffering of my people, and I'm going to send you to set my people free. And if you know the story, you know Moses protests. Who who am I? Why would you send me to do this? Moses couldn't see anything in himself that would enable him to be this person that God could use to set the Israelites free from slavery. But what God says is, what is in your hand? And Moses says, it's my staff. The staff he takes out with him to herd sheep and <laughs> take care of his, father, his father-in-law's flocks. It's the same staff he had the day before and the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. It's just his staff. And God says, throw it on the ground. And he throws it on the ground and it becomes a snake. And then God says, grab the snake by the tail, and he does, and it becomes a staff again. God says, take this staff with you. This is what you will use to accomplish what I am tasking you with doing. It's so different from other stories that we read about in mythology, the stories from other cultures where a god sends someone on a mission, but provides that hero with a a special sword or special armor or special shoes, some divine gift that nobody else has that then enables them to accomplish this great feat that the God is sending them on. Our God, the Lord God, the God of Isaac and Abraham and Jacob, sends Moses forth with nothing more than what he already has. All God asks of Moses is the willingness, the courage, the faithfulness to take that staff and to go and to trust that God has sent him and is with him. And it is that staff, that ordinary shepherd's staff, that Moses does so many marvelous signs among Pharaoh. It is that staff with which Moses parts the Red Sea. Because it's really God at the center of the story. It's not Moses. It's not the staff. It is God at the center of everything. So we all have something to offer. We all have something that God can use. And all that God asks of us is what God asks of Moses to have the faith and the courage to take what we have, to offer it fully to God, and to go forth knowing that trusting that God is with us. So this morning, as we conclude this time of worship, we are going to weave two mats that are going to help us remember, think about what we have to offer. Think about our own stories individually, but your individual story is part of our story collectively as Kingsway Baptist Church. And so as you came into service today, you were handed a strip of cloth, and in just a few moments, I'm going to invite you to prayerfully think about what has God brought you through? What is your story with this Jesus, the forgiver of sins, who's at the center of this gospel story that we proclaim and we profess? It doesn't have to be anything dramatic. 
It can be an answered prayer. It can be love that you experience, grace that you experience. It can be something big. It can be something small. But whatever it is, it's part of your story. And it's something that God can use to help you tell the bigger story, the gospel story, about who Jesus is. It's something that God can use to help us as Kingsway Baptist Church tell the story of who Jesus really is, because that's what it means to be on mission with Christ for Christ, to proclaim to the world who Jesus truly is. So the kids have come back from Sunday school to join us in this exercise, because this is something that we're really doing as a church. So just a couple of instructions. Um, If you feel the strip of fabric that you have got, you'll feel there's a slight difference in texture between one side and the other. You can write on either side. Don't stress about it, but the smoother side will hold the ink more clearly. In the pew back in front of you, in the little pen holders, you should find some permanent markers, and parents know they're permanent. (laughs) They might be a Sharpie, it might just be a black marker, but there are 160 of them in this room, so (laughs) So you ought to be able to find one nearby you somewhere. There are two tables up uh, here uh, in front of each transept. If you would like a flat surface to kind of stretch your Uh, your fabric out on to help you write, you are welcome to come up there. And then uh, when you are ready, after some thought, some some prayer, when you are ready, we're going to invite you to come forward with this strip of fabric as part of your testimony, as an offering to God this morning. And we're going to invite you to weave it into one of the two looms that's up here at the front. And if you're among the first people to come forward, we're going to ask that you start at the bottom so that everything can be supported. (laughs) We don't have things sliding down. Uh, And we're going to weave under and over. And when we're done, we're going to have two, uh, two mats that just like the paralytic in Mark 2 can stand as part of our story, our testimony of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and continues to do in our individual lives and in our collective life as Kingsway Baptist Church. So let us reflect, let us think, and when you are ready, we invite you to come forward and weave your part of your story into one of these maps.